Thank you so much for inviting me, David. It's been a great pleasure to uh, have a little tiny bit of help provided for this program, which is, which is obviously such an important one for BU and certainly for us in, a co in the College of Communication. Great chance to work with, uh, have our own students work with students they might not normally see. And obviously the issue couldn't be more important, climate change. So that uh, 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 was a labor of love to do that. Um, in today's talk, I want to talk to you about um, well, the title that we advertised was a little different than this. I think we advertised it as Heroes, Villains, and Nerds. Um, and that same, same talk, though, different title here. Uh, really what I want to do is talk to you about uh, representations of science and scientists in the media. And that in itself is a pretty interesting and uh, wide-ranging topic. And then whether those representations uh, make any difference to us in terms of what we think and know about science. And this has uh, <clears throat> been a, a long-term interest of mine because over my career, um, especially before I came here at some other universities that I worked with, I worked a lot with scien scientists in various fields, especially in fields like biotechnology and other technical science fields. And a lot of times, scientists would tell me, you know, the media get it wrong, they don't understand what, what we do, they misportray what we do, they misreport on it, they sensationalize it. You know, a long list of complaints for uh, science folks as represented in the media. And um, so the question is, are they right or wrong, or is it somewhere in between? And really, actually, what do we know about how science has been represented on the media? And you'll see when we get to the end, you'll have to remind me, because I didn't put a slide in there for this, that we need to draw this all back around to the issue of climate change. Most of the research and um, ideas that I'm going to talk about really came about before the era where we were super concerned with climate change, but they're all very relevant. So I'd like to start with really just an exercise that we can do. So. If you want to close your eyes or just think, uh, you know, whatever helps you think uh, back, I would like everyone to think about um, to think about uh, an image of, of of science or a scientist that's memorable to you. And I'll give you maybe ten seconds to think about that. Okay? Some people are closing their eyes. That's good. Those are the ones who would be more easily hypnotized later. <laughs> and so you got it, right? Okay, now let's um, raise your hand if that image comes from a movie or a television or a film portrayal. So the hands are going up. I'm going to say about half, and maybe I'll ask you guys later. And raise your hands if this comes from, uh, I guess, a real person or a situation you were in. And maybe about another half, but there's another half that didn't raise your hands. <laughs> I know I'm from Calm. We can add. So <laughs> who's that other third? Uh, we'll have to ask about that. Now, if you raised your hands just, and if you, pardon? Maybe a teacher. Could be, well, I, I said either media or, um, what was my second alternative? Real, real person. A real person, right? So a teacher would hopefully be a real person. <laughs> um, although, who knows? We'll all be replaced by, you know. <laughs> Exactly, or robots. Um, so if you raised your hand with a media um, example, uh, raise your hand again, and if you're willing to tell us who, who or what that was. Yes, sir? Jimmy Neutron. Jimmy Neutron. Oh, I think I know. He was a cartoon character, right? And what did he do? He was a, uh, he had a super-powered mind and a mechanical canine. Um, Neat. And, <laughs> and he, uh, I don't know, he just like rescued the day from pure destruction. Yeah. So uh, a science hero, a young, young. Yeah, OK. Other media examples. Go ahead. Uh, Bill Nye. Bill Nye, the science guy. Bill. Bill, right? Yeah. I can sing that song because my daughter's probably about your age, and we certainly heard that. And by the way, when I was at Cornell, uh, Bill, I think, was a Bill, I don't know him personally. Bill Nye was a Cornell grad, and so he would occasionally come back and do his, his science act, you know, or it, it was what he did. He's Other ageless. But yeah, I know. <laughs> he will never. Do that. He knows something that Jimmy Neutron probably <laughs> told him. <laughs> Who else? Any other examples? I saw numerous hands go up. Don't be embarrassed. It was a space movie. And yeah. Yeah, and and they got lost in space, and the guy, uh, the spacesuit shattered in the vacuum of space, and he fried, 
and I never forgot it. I was like six years old, but that was my, it was so scary. And yeah. I, you know, I couldn't sleep for you know, a long time, and it was, so that was my introduction. I can see you're still processing the, the, the ramifications of that. <laughs> and then you had one? Neil deGrasse Tyson, more recently, who's kind of taken over for um, the role that, uh, do you all know the name Carl Sagan? Another Cornell personage, actually. Remember uh, billions and billions of stars out there? That, that was Carl Sagan, guy who reached a lot. Any uh, villains or science? Uh, Dr. Evil. Dr. Evil, yes. Dr. Evil, uh, from the, um, the, what do you call it, the Mike Myers, uh, Austin, Austin Powers. Powers movie, right. And is he really a scientist, or what is he in that? Or is he just sort of an all-around evil genius? <laughs> Probably something like that, okay. And another example, yes. He was a scientist? He was a scientist? Yeah. What was his science, was his discipline given? Put lasers on sharks' heads. <laughs> 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 Dave, David later will tell me what branch that is. Uh, that, I remember that line. Go ahead, back there. Dexter from the cartoon? Yeah, I, oh, Dexter, wait a minute, I'm, <laughs> that's right, yeah, that would be an example, I guess he would count, yes? Uh, mm, I don't know the Powderpuff Girls, but he was a, he was a, good or, good or bad? Good. Good scientist. Powerpuff Girls, like, uh, X. Yeah, right, okay. Uh, any last one or two? Yeah, go ahead. Victor Frankenstein. Victor Frankenstein. And who is he? He stitched together dead people. Yes. <laughs> Not unlike putting lasers on shark heads, shark's heads. And he created, of course, Frankenstein's monster. Um, and uh, that's a good smattering of different kinds of images of science that we can talk about. Um, so when we look at this in our field, um, as I said, one of the big concerns comes to us from people in science fields who are concerned. If you think about all these different images of science that are out there, you can probably think about both good and bad things that would go with each of those representations and concerns about whether that would be, uh, you know, if that got blown up to be sort of everything uh, a person could know about science, how well um, that would really uh, produce a, a public that is well educated and interested in science. Um, so that's, that's number one. And number two, we've got an awful lot of um, research in our field uh, that suggests that media representations uh, do matter. And so I'll show you some of that research as we go through, um, as we go through the talk here. Um, so it's interesting that you, let's see, who mentioned Victor Frankenstein? Your, your name is? Katie, you mentioned Victor Frankenstein, and this, um, a, a, as, you, as you'll see as we go through the talk, there are kind of a variety of archetypes of scientists that are portrayed pretty frequently in the media. Some good, some bad, some evil, some heroic, some more so than others, um, that are interesting to look at and interesting to think about in terms of their impact on us as viewers or consumers of stories. So, with, um, with the, uh, Frank, and we all know the story of Frankenstein and his monster, right? He, he creates, uh, uh, attempts to create a human from, as you say, dead people, and kind of gives it a jolt of electricity and puts some bolts in, and, and then it goes downhill from there. It's a, it's a, it's a cautionary tale, obviously. Um, and this idea, the idea that's represented in Frankenstein, has probably been one of the most frequent that's gotten attention in terms of looking at narrative, fictional portrayals of science. And by the way, of course, Frankenstein is a novel, Mary Shelley, going back to the early 1800s. So this concern predates the era of television and film and now internet and, and Netflix and so forth that we'll talk about today. So it's actually been kind of um, what I would call a very natural hypothesis for us uh, doing me well, uh, media effects research, looking at how media affects us, to look at uh, this issue of kind of the mad scientist. That's a, a very common term for that. I in other words, is science portrayed largely or perhaps stereotypically in the media as uh, running out of control, as dangerous, as being something that's done by people who you know are a bit deranged or mentally ill? Um, 
Uh, and so this uh, it was probably one of the first hypotheses that was investigated. And it's simply the hypothesis that uh, media negatively sensationalizes science, OK? Uh, and I'll just show you some examples of, of characters here that, uh, that might uh, fit this particular archetype. So there's your guy. That's, uh, that's Victor Frankenstein there in an early movie. And he's, he's hard at work. Um, plotting, uh, you know, usually the issue here with these scientists is that they're seen as, quote, playing God. And obviously that's a negative theme in a story. So there's a good example of one. You may know this gentleman. Uh, any, anyone know who this is? Dr. Yep. Yeah, that's Dr. Strangelove from the movie Dr. Strangelove. Um, I forget his branch of science, probably nuclear physics or something like that. And again, you know, somebody who is, in this case, has created a doomsday machine. So again, <laughs> playing God. Um, bless you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, who do we have here? Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, I always mix up which is which, but it doesn't really matter, <laughs> right? Again, uh, an old story, not just from the era of electronic media. And um, nobody mentioned this fellow. Um, <laughs> from the movie uh, Back to the Future. That's Doc. I forget his, his, his last name. Um, one of my favorite examples is not really a scientist, but an example of the theme of technology out of control, which of course is closely allied with uh, this, the person being out of control, and actually with the theme of technology that takes on human character and form and, and threatens to overturn us. I'm talking, of course, about who? You know Hal, right? The computer who said, I'm sorry, Dave. I'm, I'm afraid I can't do that. And um, if you don't know who Hal is, you really need to watch that movie. It's a, it's a great science one. And um, just for fun, you know who he is? That's The Fly. The Fly was an older movie from the 50s, I think. There was a remake in the 80s or early 90s with Jeff Goldblum. And, and he becomes a fly due to some experiments that go awry. And so these six pictures encapsulate a lot of the different themes that you see if you're concerned with this mad science or science is dangerous trope, which is that the person is often, often uh, there's, there's hubris there, or there's belief that um, I, I can control this, I can play God, I have the power, if you will, um, uh, that experimental procedures often run amok and out of control, and that eventually they have to be controlled by some other forces that are external to science, right? And if this were our view, if this were the only view really that we had of science, it might make sense to some of those scientists who used to talk to me who said, Jim, they're always, you know, sensationalizing it and stretching the truth and so forth, and what they see in the movies is not really science, um, and so forth. And obviously, I could pick a lot of other examples that would fit this particular group if I wanted to. The reason I started with this and called it kind of a natural hypothesis is that's where the media researchers who began looking at images of scientists started. So we can go back to, uh, let's start by talking a little bit about television. We can go back to um, the period of the 60s and the 70s in this country. Television was the dominant mass medium then. It wasn't anything like what you know it as now. It was really three major television networks, ABC, CBS, NBC. That was it. And generally, you watched what was on those networks on that night. And generally speaking, by the way, everybody watched. So it was a very dominant monolithic mass medium. Probably the biggest concern that was around with television in the 60s had to do with violence on television. That would be a separate and interesting lecture. But what it uh, prodded in terms of social science researchers like myself looking at it was investigation into really uh, what are the images of television. And if we sit down and look at them and really start to count them in a sense, almost like doing a a demography or a census of television, we might learn something interesting. And so uh, late 60s and early 70s, uh, formal research efforts to actually watch television and code it for what was happening began. 
so that research, and this, by the way, this effort was prompted by the Surgeon General of the United States, who was directed by the President to figure out, is television making us violent? That was kind of the, the social concern at that time. Well, violence is not so much the issue for us today, but what is the issue for us today is this long-standing data sets that started to be collected about who's on TV, you know, who are they, what kind of people are they, what do they do, and so forth. So um, this research was done uh, first by a man named George Gerbner. He was the dean of the uh, School of Communication at Annenberg uh, in Philadelphia, Annenberg East, we now call it. He's a very prominent researcher in our field, and he literally gathered groups of students, undergrads and grads, to watch and code television in a systematic way. And his belief was that television was a very important cultural indicator. When David mentioned cultural indicators earlier as one of my research interests, that's what he's talking about. The idea that television might be a window onto our culture, but that it also might be kind of a distorted window in terms of whether it represents or misrepresents. Some examples of those kinds of representations that were of concern, uh, especially in the early days, if you counted up all the people on television, there you'd have twice as many men as women on, on your television screen, if you just counted you know, gender or sex. And of course, obviously, in real life, it's more like a 50, there's even a slightly more women. And so researchers began to think, gee, is that, you know, what's that distortion about? And also, what effect might it have on us? And if you've heard, you know, just in the media or in your life, the average child will see blah, blah, blah murders in their lifetime, you know, a statistic like that. Again, this would come out of that research. So Gerbner could tell you what percentage of shows had violence, the split of, of men and women and whites and blacks, and really a lot of different kinds of things. And he also looked at occupations that people had on television. You would probably get the answer if I asked you, what do you think is the, are the most common occupations on television? It's not science. Pardon me? Doctors and cops, yeah, and actually these are the two that are going to be in my slide. Uh, uh, legal, medical, and police, you know, are, are your top three. Um, and uh, it doesn't take us long to arrive at the answer that you got. And I think if we think about it, we can think why that is, that these are folks who fit a lot of the narrative conventions of, uh, of television, and of course movies too. Um, and scientists less so. Scienti not that scientists don't fit at all. After all, I showed you just right before, I think, six real good stories that did involve science. So it's not that science is never represented, but certainly one of Gerbner's early conclusions. And he was funded by the NSF, actually, to, to answer these questions early on. Um, his, uh, his, finding, his first finding was that there's just a lot fewer scientists uh, than other occupations on television. Um, and uh, another thing that they did in this, in this form of research was they, um, when you coded, an, if you code an individual character on a television program, uh, and let me think of a science character that I remember from my days, uh, maybe Lost in Space, you mentioned the movie, but I think of the television show, and uh, I think that had some scientists on it, some good, some bad, like Dr. Smith was kind of a, you, I don't, you guys won't know him, but anyway. Um, a coder in this research project would look at that character and make decisions about is this a good character, a bad, maybe mixed, um, a strong, weak, you know, different character attributes. Um, and so one of the things that Gerbner found first was that if you looked at the uh, mix of sort of good and bad scientists on television, uh, what he called villainous and virtuous, um, for every villainous scientist, there were five uh, virtuous ones. So um, you probably think, well, great for science. You know, that's a lot of good scientists are out there. Uh, however, he, made, he also made a comparison to the other fields that you mentioned in your answer, sort of medical and legal. So it turns out that the ratios are much different for other kinds of uh, characters. So that for villainous doctors, for every one of those, you'd have you know, close to 20 uh, virtuous ones, and even more so for law enforcement, where they're almost always good. So um, this was the kind of um, portrayal of the television demography that Gerbner 
was starting to produce really and, and began doing that in 1967. And the images of science that he looked at really were mostly through the early 70s. He made a few other kinds of findings that are interesting as a starting place for us. Um, for programs, he looked at what were the, you know, the major themes of these programs. Uh, and usually the major themes would be relationships and crime and, uh, uh, and or, you know, medical settings or family. Family relationships and crime were probably the top three. Science, specifically as a theme, was very, very, was, was relatively seldom in the television demography of that time. And keeping in mind that there were not a, a lot of other television outlets, you know, you had, didn't have a science channel or a, a, a National Geographic channel. Uh, science could appear occasionally here and there, and there were some good examples of science programs that we might talk about as we go through. But by and large, it's kind of ghettoized and, and marginalized. And so for Gerbner early on, he thought, this is his uh, quote from him, that scientists have uh, a greater share of quote, troublesome and ambivalent portrayals. Um, so Gerbner was tending towards the view that uh, there may be a problem here in terms of whether, uh, whether science is being typecast as something that's actually dangerous to us as a society. And of course, Gerbner had also come out of, uh, it was, was active in the 60s and the 70s, having been through the Cold War and so forth, where often issues of, uh, let's say, nuclear science were very, very top of people's mind and very, very fearful, and a, a high dread factor was involved. Uh, they are older and stranger than other professionals, and they are more likely to be foreigners. Uh, and nothing against foreigners, but oops, he, he, yikes. We will have a brief pause while we skip this version. Right? Skip it. Remind me later. That's what we'll do. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Macintosh. <laughs> um, let's see, where was it? Oh, and, and, so, and so just overall, this was kind of a, a, a negative picture that Gerbner was, was uh, creating. Um, and that's it on the content side. Now, um, the other side of our, of our question here today is, does that have an effect or not? And first of all, I want to tell you that from a scientific standpoint, and uh, from, uh, it, it can be very difficult to establish a specific causal connection between uh, the programs that you see, let's say, as a child, and later attitudes and, and behaviors that you manifest uh, in quote unquote real life. And the reason for that is the, me the methods of science for typically demonstrating such causality are experimental. And it could be hard to create really a good experimental lab in which we take one population and expose them to you know, a bunch of violence, say, and then another, and they see no television and you know, compare them. That's, so we're often reliant on very large scale macro social data to make inferences from. And, and it can be messy. But from Gerbner's standpoint, he thought that the messages of television uh, were important to, to how we think about the world. He called this approach cultivation because he believed that the real impact of television was something that would be experienced over time. In other words, we could all name a specific movie that might have scared us or that, or that made us happy or made us cry or a really violent one that maybe made us cringe or whatever. We've all seen those kinds of movies and we all, or, or television shows. And we all know also that we don't imitate those acts that we see. Um, so that question of imitation, which was actually being considered by the social science establishment of the time, was ruled out by Gerbner. He thought it was really more of like a residual kind of background effect where um, if you've seen, uh, to go back to my example of the genders and the, the unbalance in portrayals there, if you've seen that, how's that going to affect your view of the world um, in a much more uh, unconscious uh, level in the background of your mind over time. So cultivation was meant to imply over time the images of television become those that influence just our view of what is real. And his real argument there was for the heavy viewer, especially the heavy viewer, this was his terminology, heavy viewer of that time, you might have had a person watching four, five, six, or more hours of television a day. And so multiply that across 
uh, the days and the weeks and the months of the year, and you see just how much, uh, how great a percentage of that person's life was actually spent watching television. Not that they would tell you Star Trek is real, you know, or, or Jimmy Neutron is a real character. That would be indicative of something else. But rather, that the lessons and the character and the, and the cast portrayals of those show, shows do begin to affect uh, how we think about the world. So uh, some of Gardner's early um, effects research looking at this question were uh, as follows. He, uh, he typically, he would really just look at heavy and light viewers and do comparisons of them, try to control for other social and demographic factors, and reach a conclusion. So he thought that heavy viewers were more likely to think that science makes our way of life too fast. Again, the running out of control technology is problematic and dangerous for us. Uh, and these were in his reports to the NSF at the time, so they got a lot of attention. Um, or that uh, the growth of science might mean that uh, just a few people control our lives. Who are these scientists? What are they doing? Do they have more control than they should have? That kind of thing. Um, and Gerbner was also well known for a finding he called mainstreaming. Uh, and mainstreaming means, and I've pulled it out of an old report of his, literally from the early 80s, where what he's showing here, um, if, my, uh, if my arrow works, he measured, again, using survey data, uh, large-scale survey data. On, the, on his y-axis here, there goes my arrow, um, he was plotting really, I think, confidence in science. Okay, So the more, the higher you would be on the x-axis, the more you would be likely to give positive answers to questions about uh, your confidence in science as an institution. And then uh, down here, he looked at light, medium, and heavy viewers. And he would compare categories of individuals. In this case, uh, income categories. So this dark line here represents the higher income group of his time. Interesting, that was over $25,000. That was the high income group then. And the low income group down here under 10000 And this was a pattern that he saw very frequently in a lot of his data. Called it mainstreaming because he thought that it indicated that there was a bit of a convergence in outlooks of people who were heavy viewers of television who otherwise differed on social and demographic measures. Um, and that became a very consistent finding of Gerbner's uh, across a lot of different kinds of issues, not just science, but many ideological and politically oriented kinds of issues seem to demonstrate this pattern. So, uh, and, and the metaphor of mainstreaming fits nicely with his cultivation uh, sense of sort of a broad cultural current, if you will, all right? But you know, even Gerbner, I think, realized that he was probably being a little too monochrome, if you will, about science and painting it too harshly. And just as you all did, he would have sat down and realized there's actually a lot of positive portrayals too. And so in later reports that he did, uh, he claimed that, or he didn't claim, he said, you know, there is no basis to the claim of any kind of systematic negative portrayals of science because what happens, what happened was, over the years as he gathered data. And he really amassed the largest set of data about people on television. He concluded that it was more, that there was more to it than just the, the bad, if you will. There's a good and the bad and, and the ugly to it. And we'll look at some of that here uh, going forward. So, um, uh, Gerbner passed away probably, I don't know, five or, or seven years ago. Gerbner uh, worked a lot with a small team of researchers, one of whom was named Michael Morgan. And Michael Morgan was actually my doctoral advisor, so this is kind of how I got tied into this body of research. And still we have access to this long-term longitudinal data set that's, that, Gerbner's been, that Gerbner started collecting and that is now collected in various places, including here at BU. We do parts of the data collection here. Um, so, you know, these are not at the same level of granularity and fineness as, you know, the ice core that you guys might get out of the Antarctic and so forth, but it's an interesting cultural ice core in some ways uh, and that we use a lot. So, um, uh, Nancy Signorelli was one of Gerbner's colleagues and I work with her a lot. She's at Delaware and she's kind of the one keeping these data sets going. So, she gave me some, uh, some data that uh, just to show where portrayals have gone with science on network television. 
And so I just, she ran some comparisons for me, and I'm just showing sort of who are the good, uh, uh, the, the percentage of characters who are good. And what she did was she divided pre-2000 and post-2000. And these data can be difficult to interpret unless you know a lot about television. And some of you guys may know more about me than television. We, we might conclude, oh, wow, scientists are actually getting better portrayed, you know. Seems like maybe we finally learned that scientists are good people, you know. Uh, and there's probably some of that going on. I think also, though, just knowing what I know about this data set, um, who do you think are the most popular scientists on television right now? Yeah, the Big Bang Theory is actually one of the top, I don't know, five shows or some weeks it's a top show, right? And they've got different scientists on there. They're physicists and I don't watch the show, but you know, different, I know, the, I, I know it a little bit. And they're all good characters, right? They're good people. And so, uh, and because they are actually a big chunk of the, the scientists that we now measure on network television, I think that pushes these numbers up a little bit. Yes? No, well, you know, we could argue about that. We try to train coders to do it the same way every year, obviously. And so has the definition of good changed since the 1960s? In a sense, it may have. Here's, I was about to get to a similar point, which is that what's happened with network television is that a lot of the shows, uh, it, we have many more uh, television networks now, right? Really what we're looking at here still are ABC, CBS, and NBC. So we now have all different kinds and genres of shows. You have premium cable shows, you know, some of which can be very dark and violent, you know, like uh, The Sopranos or something like that. Um, and so what's actually happened is on network, the demographic viewing network shows has gotten older, probably more, you know, my up towards, uh, as younger people watch different places. Some, some young people, when I ask them today, what do you watch on television? They say, I don't watch television. And then they start telling me about the shows that I watch. And I said, wait a minute, you just said you don't watch television. By which they mean, well, I watch it on my computer or on my phone or, you know, on my Google Glass or maybe not that yet, but right, you know. So, um, so I think it's a good question. I really think what's happening here is that the universe that we started measuring back in the 60s has changed. And so that the network television world is a little safer and older and, and less violent, as you'll see in the next slide here, where we look at levels of, of characters who are involved in violence. Uh, in Gerbner's early days, he had a lot of scientists involved in violence. And these were on shows, the, the networks in those days had more action shows, more action, violent kinds of shows, and that's kind of uh, dropped off as well. So um, I didn't want to use these data to say that, you know, our culture as a whole is becoming more or less, um, more or less sanguine, if you will, about science. Uh, because I think if we did have a data set that included HBO, Showtime, and anything on Netflix and Hulu and all those other things, and the problem is we don't really have a, a good data set like that right now, we'd probably see actually more stability in representations. And that makes sense to me because stories and story types and the kinds of things that we're going to talk about here throughout the rest of this talk um, actually probably don't change that much throughout the course of human history. But it does lead us to this idea that maybe we should think about a broader media ecosystem, if you will, and its impact on people's knowledge and attitudes about science. So. Somebody who uh, did research in this area, who actually spoke here two weeks ago, I think it was, Matt Nisbet. If you were here, you saw him give a talk about, um, uh, you know, the, the major figures in climate change advocacy when he was a grad student, uh, back, and we were back at Cornell. He did a study looking at what he called reservations or promise. And he recognized in his study that people can really have maybe two kinds of major attitudes about science, and, and we can have them simultaneously, actually. We can hold reservations, meaning I'm concerned about certain things, like if, uh, if I'm a person who's worried about GMOs, or if, I'm, if, I'm, if I think that nuclear power is, has dangers, and so on and so forth. Those might be reservations that I hold. And at the same time, I can see science itself as having certain kinds of promise. Um, and it's not contradictory to really have such attitudes simultaneously, although, of course, some people might tend one way 
or another. So he gathered a lot of data. I think he took his data from the National Science Board uh, data set, looking at basically some attitudes that people hold about science and the relationship of different kinds of media use to those attitudes. Now, um, I'll explain this somewhat complex look looking graph. It's not really that complicated. Over here, these boxes represent where he was um, measuring whether you know, your belief in the promise of science and a higher value of that would indicate I'm, I'm optimistic about science. And reservations up here, which would mean, oh, hold on, I have concerns about it, right? And so the boxes just represent variables in kind of a causal model that he's trying to build. Back here you can see, uh, I hope you can see, maybe it's too small, he, was, he put television use here. He included a, a lot of other kinds of media use as well though. So uh, newspaper use, we would find up here. Uh, science magazines, which, were, which we would, might argue is an important contributor to what we think about science, are measured here and science television. And these are all things that were, um, that were measured in the NSB data. So he, he had access to a fairly large sample of people's media habits and their beliefs um, about science. And so what he found, really we can see by tracing various lines here, was that um, for, for television use and its relationship to reservations, it's a pretty small number. This 0.04 indicates, gee, hardly any relationship whatsoever. And there's no line at all from here to belief in promise. So he's showing really no direct relationship of media use television to either of those two important dependent variables. Um, but he does, uh, for instance, find, uh, and, and here's really the, the third kind of mediating variable that he introduced, is the idea that knowledge of science, what he called either procedural science knowledge or factual science knowledge, are important personal characteristics that might actually mediate the impact of media's effect on us. And so here, for instance, he finds a pretty, uh, for, for social science, a pretty moderate-sized relationship between television use and procedural science knowledge, which is negative, meaning heavy television viewers have less procedural science knowledge. Procedure, procedural meant understanding things like experimental methodology and random sampling and those kinds of things, okay? And so, and what he then shows, and, and it's kind of picking out the important arrows here, is that such knowledge can uh, impact either reservations or belief in the promise of science. And up here, the same thing is true for factual science knowledge. Usually factual science knowledge, this is an interesting thing, when it's measured nationally, um, and the NSF has done this and other surveys have done this, it'll usually be a, a set of maybe eight to 15 factual questions about science, like, you know, does the, does the earth revolve around the sun and those kinds of things. And surprisingly, and sometimes unfortunately, there's plenty of people who can't answer all those kinds of basic questions. So it's actually a very rudimentary and sketchy kind of uh, science knowledge that many Americans have. So Nisbet's real conclusion is that um, something like uh, uh, newspaper use, for instance, which you would expect to have maybe a positive correlation to knowledge, does so. Television has a negative correlation. and um, it's a, it's a uh, broader and more uh, uh, subtle view of the media ecosystem that's out there. Later, and in, a, in just a greatly simplified version, uh, Dudo, researcher named Dudo came along and kind of really just tried to add the internet into this picture. And so the conclusion that's being reached here is that as important as the images of television and other media uh, and their contribution are to what people think about science. Also important is how those media either promote or retard, if you will, the acquisition of real knowledge about science. Television, we know from a lot of research, is not a medium that is usually associated with things like uh, academic achievement. You know, there's plenty of studies on television use and 
reading ability or success in school, academic ability, all those kinds of things. The, the most dominant theory of why that's so is that television use displaces time that would be spent on acquiring those other skills and abilities. Uh, that's a controversial thing, but it's a pretty uh, common assertion. In other words, simply the more time you spend, you spend watching television, the less you will be uh, spending developing some of these other kinds of things. But when, for instance, internet comes on the scene, that's a much different kind of medium, and now equally dominant with television. And there are a lot of different arguments we could make um, about um, whether the internet actually counter, uh, counteracts, if you will, the impacts of what used to be a very mass-mediated uh, television system. So the picture is, being, is becoming murkier and, and, and a little cloudier, but we're, we're learning that there are different kinds of effects, sometimes countervailing effects, that different media can have with each other. And of course, still a lot of uh, confusion and no certainty about any of these answers. Here was a, an example of Dudo, where he found a similar kind of mainstreaming effect this was measuring uh, just kind of positivity um, uh, towards science in his data set, which came from the National Opinion Research Center, um, and showing how uh, heavy viewers across two different groups, those with or without college science, were more similar than some of the than lighter viewing groups. So it's an echo of Gerbner's uh, earlier finding. So just to summarize to where we are briefly, we started kind of with, I would say, a somewhat um, stereotype view that science is really portrayed negatively in the media, and that is the reason why we have, if you will, quote, problems with science as a culture, whether it's lack of trust or belief that science is dangerous. Um, but that was kind of the early salvo of research. And over the, let's see, since the late 60s, the 30 or 40 years that we've been doing research, the picture has been changing in a lot of ways, new colors being introduced, and so forth. As I thought about interesting ways to kind of talk about um, science more specifically, I began to wonder, and here I'm kind of getting out of the realm of data now and, and more into uh, speculation, whether science in the media might be stereotyped by various disciplines, right? In other words, can you think, uh, if I mention a kind of science to you, whether you would expect to, that to receive a positive or a negative portrayal in the media? Do you think that's possible to think that? All right, so we could play a little game and see whether that happens. If I say ecology, is that, how's that going to look? Everybody, they're giving me thumbs up down here. Uh, can you think of like a, a positive ecological role model from our media that we might expect to see? Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall, right. Yes, another one? Dr. Planet. Captain Planet. Captain Planet. Dr. Planet. Dr. Planet. Come on, he's man. Been studying the past few years. Pardon me? He went back to school. Oh, he's now a doctor. He got his PhD. <laughs> yeah, Captain Planet was a 90s television show. And by the way, it's an interesting story in terms of the relationship of of the media and the environment. The, the, whole, all reason, the, the reason I got interested in media and environment in the first place had a lot to do with climate change. Back in the 80s when I was doing my graduate work, uh, climate change was starting to get some notice in the media. You know, uh, Bill McKibben had written his book and uh, I forget what year, but the Earth was like the planet of the year for Time Magazine. You know how Time Magazine usually has a person of the year? That year, it was just a planet. And you know we beat out Neptune and Saturn and Pluto. <laughs> uh, but I mean, the point was to, to focus on uh, environmental issues. And so uh, Captain Planet was produced uh, by Ted Turner, who uh, in his life has considered himself a pretty prominent uh, environmentalist. And so there's a group of kids, probably your age, raised with Captain Planet and the rings and everything, right? And the, uh, and it, in those years, it was pretty common to have a lot of positively themed environmental messages on television. Uh, and we started studying those, whether they had a positive or a negative impact. And what I, what I kind of felt later on more pessimistically was that they were kind of lost in, this, in the sea of everything else. But yeah, so he would be a, a positive example. The one that I remember is, uh, is this guy. Do you know who that is? Yeah, that's Jacques Cousteau. And when I was young, you know, in, and in middle school, uh, Jacques Cousteau's television show was very, very popular, viewed by 
uh, millions, you know, tens, uh, dozens of millions of people. Um, and that was, you know, must-see viewing in our household. And really, you know, um, many, many possibilities for positive impacts on people's attitudes about the environment came from this program. The one that I remember most vividly, and if, you know, if, if you had asked me the question that I asked you earlier about a scientist that you remember, I would have said Jacques Cousteau, because I remembered a show where he was doing a show that involved um, seal and seal hunting and baby seals. And there was a, you know, he, had, he was French and he had this French accent. And the, the mother seal was killed by one of the hunters, you know, clubbed and so forth. And so you hear the baby seal going, you know, like that. And he's saying, this seal will not survive the winter. Uh, and, you know, very, and sad music comes up and very, very powerful emotional stuff. And, you know, certainly one of the most well-known scientists of our time uh, and kind of cool, the guy who invented scuba and all that. So you think ecology probably gets a, a, probably a pretty good rep. Not that we couldn't find an evil ecologist, but I'm just speculating here. What about anthropology? I picked that as a, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's a cool one, right? And uh, is he anthropologist or archaeologist or... Or, anyway, you know, um, <laughs> what's that? I said he's not an archaeologist. <laughs> he's not. Well, I mean, on the on the film, what's he what's he what's he call himself? <laughs> I'm not suggesting that an archaeologist should be modeled on Indiana Jones. Although having the whip and everything would be, you know, uh, kind of cool. Uh, yeah, anthropology. I picked this person. Um, She's the, um, that's Sigourney Weaver, right? And I'm pretty sure she's an anthropologist in that movie, Avatar, um, because, you know, she's the one that understands the culture and, and, you know, it's a very good portrayal for her. What about sciences that would get a bum rap or a negative rap? Nobody wants to say that one. They're gonna, you're going to offend somebody, yeah. Robotics and artificial intelligence. Yeah, I can think of a number. Of course, I had Hal earlier, who was artificial intelligence. And oftentimes, that does seem to run out of control. Let me, I think that's a good example. Let me suggest a few that have, again, I'm, I'm making wild generalizations here. But it's interesting to think about different images that come up. Uh, electricity, the study of, of the phenomenon of electricity uh, is an early one that was kind of falls into these group of sciences where some elemental or mysterious force seems to be comprehended only by a very few people. And it almost always gets the, the less, the, 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 that's like the power of life kind of image or something like that. So there is a scene from uh, Bride of Frankenstein where, as you can see, there's quite an elaborate electric, uh, electric setup to, con to confer life into these monsters. Um, and of course, early on in, in our history with science and technology, electricity was one of those first things that, uh, that uh, was mysterious to, pe to many people, right? Uh, let's see what other examples I have. Genetics oftentimes is uh, problematic, right? You have, you have th this issue with you know, scientists telling you that this is the code of life, this is almost a secret code, and, and I'm going to work with that. And, and again, you get that playing God theme. Um, uh, nuclear science, whether it be physics or other kinds of a anything involving nuclear technology, has certainly been one of the most negatively portrayed over the years. Uh, I picked a, a scene from the movie The Day After. I think most of you are too young to remember that movie. A movie that was seen by pretty much everyone on network television in the year 1983 or something like that. Um, I picked it because I know the guy who wrote it. Uh, he, his daughter was friends with my daughter, and uh, it was a major television movie. In the days when major television movies had an enormous impact, there are actually social science studies on the impact of this particular movie on people's fear of nuclear power. Um, and I think chemistry sometimes gets thrown in there um, as well. Uh, so again, you know, very broad generalizations, but interesting to think about. Again, Gerbner started thinking just sort of about science as a big monolithic thing. And I think we know that science can, comes in many different forms and can be used in many different ways in many different kinds of media. 
uh, again, usually to some purpose of the storyteller. I thought in honor of uh, our host, we should ask how are geologists represented? What would the stereotype be of a geologist? I don't think we really need a stereotype. We have uh, Professor Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a movie scene, right? <laughs> He's waiting for the Martians to come attack. And, and the, no, I'm sorry about that, dear. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Um, so, and, and, and the other thing, I'll take that off so we don't agree. <laughs> um, and you know, there's an awful lot of different kinds of science. If we really, if we, if if we as researchers don't want to be uh, stereotyping the stereotyping, if you will, all the social sciences, with psychology, sociology, a lot of different kinds of things. And that's, by the way, to say nothing about how uh, medical science uh, and doctors and other kinds of like forensic science that would be a whole area. Uh, we could have a whole lecture. I don't know if any of you have heard of the so-called CSI effect. Maybe raise your hand if you have one or two. What's the CSI effect? Uh, that juries are expecting much more evidence. Yeah. Exactly. The idea would be that we've seen hour after hour after hour of CSI or whatever, and they're always successful, right? And it's always by virtue of some cool, you know, uh, miraculous discovery that they make. Um, and literally then juries who've been kind of raised on this go into a courtroom and say, well, you know, just go and do a poly scan, you know, <laughs> or whatever it would be. Uh, and it can create, a, it can re create an issue. Um, and similarly, a lot of studies on the portrayals of doctors who, you know, doctors are an interesting case. First of all, not all of them are scientists. They're often, you know, more practitioners. Uh, but medical science is a huge uh, a huge uh, focus for, for so much of our storytelling. Um, and, and oftentimes doctors, you know, we know if, if, we, do, um, if we do simple surveys of people about uh, occupational prestige, in other words, if I ask a bunch of people, what are the most prestigious occupations? Doctors usually score uh, at the top of that list, you know, medical doctors. And similarly, they score very highly and virtuously in our television and movie uh, portrayals. And probably what we have is sort of a reciprocal relationship between the two. Um, but it's definitely a storytelling system that favors doctors. Let me just give you one or two more comments, and I know we're, we're running close to the end of time here. I'm also interested in the role of science fiction, right? How many of you enjoy science fiction? Sure, and I love science fiction too. I mean, who doesn't love science fiction? Um, in fact, uh, science fiction is becoming so, I think, uh, popular. If you go to the movies now, and uh, the movies are undergoing a lot of change as well um, these days, certainly uh, fewer people going to them, more people watching at home, but more younger people going to them. I just gathered some data about genres of movies that are the, the top box office um, year by year by year. And that orange blob on top that, that kind of looks like it's trending towards bigger, that's the science fiction films are garnering larger and larger shares of box office. Um, and you know, it does depend a little bit on what you call a science fiction movie. A lot of comic book movies are, you know, comic book movies are very popular now. A lot of those will fall into a, a science fiction genre. A lot of them have those science content, I believe. You know, Iron Man would be a good example of that. There's certainly a lot of science and technology there. And I, I forget what Tony Stark is. He's sort of industrialist slash scientist or something like that. But, you know, a trend like that is really needs, uh, needs our attention and more research. And I've read studies that go both ways. There are those who would be concerned with science fiction in the sense of, does it sensationalize? A lot of these mad scientist examples that I was giving you came out of the world of science fiction. But there are those who argue, no, science fiction actually is sort of a, almost a training ground for interest in science and for young people with predilection or interest in scientific topics, a lot of times you will find uh, some science fiction at the root of that. Um, the, the, and, and the genre is permeating now more television as well. So we can, there's, there's more science fiction to be seen, not just in the movies, 
but on television. And so I think that uh, you know the, this makes the picture even more diverse and probably multicolored than than Gerbner thought back in the 80s. Um, I just want to make a few basic conclusions, and then we can have some questions and observations. Number one, I think that modern entertainment media, as we understand them, uh, really uh, extend universal story types that go back to Mary Shelley, as you said, Frankenstein. That's before modern media. And so a lot of the, uh, the stories that we watch today um, are classic and universal kinds of things that people have always been interested in. And so there probably will always be an interest in the, the mad scientist stereotype, M much as there will also be an interest in the science as hero stere uh, stereotype, or archetype, we would probably say, uh, or the scientist as nerd, uh, any of these kinds of common figures. Um, so what we're seeing is new in this, in the you know technologically, and what we can see in terms of uh, the production values and so forth. But the stories are often very, very similar. Uh, heroes who can control their world are not new to science, right? They have been around in other forms, and I think I maybe put some examples here. Oh wait, next one we'll have. Um, and, and similarly for villains who go too far or play God, we can go back into some of the earliest literature and find these themes, which tells me those themes and archetypes will probably be around for a while. Another point that I would make is that science, in a way, extends magic, meaning that magic is what people used to do to try to control their world. Um, magic is something you would have to be trained in. There would be arcane rules of how to do it and a belief in its effectiveness. It was a human attempt to control our environment. And obviously now we rely more on science and technology to do that. But if we, re if we remember sort of the historical connection between those two, um, it's then not surprising to us that some of science might be subsumed within sort of the black arts, the black magic that used to be a, a, a key part of so many stories. So if we pick a bad wizard like this guy, that is, you must know who that is, right? That's Saruman, right? By the way, I can never tell Saruman from Gando. They look so similar to me, as you're about to see. But anyway, he's a bad wizard, right? He does black magic, bad things. He's, he's a mad scientist of his era. And eventually, of course, he is defeated. Um, so I think it's not that crazy to think that we have these archetypes nowadays. I picked the comedic example of Dr. Evil, and I was happy to somebody mentioned Dr. Evil early, earlier. And then, of course, we have you know the good magic. So there's Gandalf. Now tell me, they look really similar, don't you think? <laughs> but anyway, I do know the difference. And who would you pick as like a hero, a science hero who can control his world from today's media? I got to tell you, I was sitting at graduation, you know, two or three years ago, up on the big stage behind the speaker. And it wasn't the speaker that got the biggest applause. It was a guy who stood up and did this. <laughs> right? Who's that? Don't say Dr. Spock. He's a different scientist. It's Mr. Spock. Oh, my God. And it was like a chill went up everybody's spine. Oh, my God, that's Mr. Spock, you know? <laughs> and a guy who, like, seems to have every uh, arcane detail of science at his disposal and becomes a hero for that. And actually, in the later Star Trek movies, this is, of course, Spock from the show, he becomes almost an action hero, too, so a very you know, virile kind of scientist. Uh, uh, interesting to think about. So uh, what's the lesson? Uh, you tell me. Thank you very much.